I can start by throwing out a favorite Nintendo character that will probably get me glared at by most of you, but Uh-oh. I'm going to go with Ganondorf for my favorite. Okay, no, that's... That's right, I'm, I'm going with the villain. That's it. No, that's a good choice. Go with the ginger. <laughs> you know, that's not, not why I was going for it, Alex. It's not always about the gingers. No, no it's not always about it's me It's rarely all. about the gingers. So, uh, I like Ganondorf just because, obviously, Zelda is one of my favorite franchises, probably my, my overall favorite franchise, and I've been playing it ever since I was a little kid, so... I've enjoyed seeing his character progress and just get fleshed out from game to game. Um, you know, back in the original on NES and, you know, the the sequel adventure of Link, he was just kind of this pig monster demon beast yeah. who wanted to, you know, kill everyone, and there wasn't much story to yeah, it. Yeah, he was because... just kind of like a generic big ol' end boss guy. Right, exactly. But, you know, in, in, with the Link to the Past, they started to flesh him out a little more. He kind of had, like, a grand master plan, and, and he, like, manipulated Dragmire. people. Yeah, Dragmar. Totally canon. <laughs> but, yeah, and they, they fleshed out his backstory, you know, gave him, like, a, a human side and everything. So then it was cool, you know, progressing on to Ocarina of Time to actually get to see that story played out. To see him as, you know, Ganondorf, the King of Thieves, and his, his, his like, transformation into the Demon King, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And I think where it really gets interesting then is because of, you know, time travel bullcrap. Woohoo. Uh, Ocarina of Time has two endings, which results in two separate timelines. And you get to see that same Ganondorf in two alternate versions of history develop very different personality traits just because of, you know, his environments and his, uh, you know the, the stories he goes through. Like mm-hmm. on, uh, on the adult timeline, as they call it, you have Wind Waker. Dude, where the Wind Waker backstory for Ganondorf? That is so good! Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He, he has, he like, these some... amazing speeches at the end that made me, like, re- that's, like, some of the best writing Nintendo's ever done. Yeah, yeah. definitely. It's it's really dramatic, and it gives his character a little more nuance. Yeah, He's absolutely. not just this, you know, horrible, evil villain. Like, at the end of Ocarina of Time, he's talking about how he wants to hunt down Link and Zelda's descendants and exterminate yeah, yeah. them. But then you see a completely different person in Wind Waker. Yeah, like, you know, he, he actually re- has real history. motivations. Exactly. But then you, you look on the other timeline, Twilight Princess, where he didn't get sealed in the Sacred Realm, where instead... You know, they tried to execute him, and he survived because he was, you know, divinely granted the Triforce of Power. So his personality is completely different in Twilight Princess because he develops this just out of control god complex ego because, you know, he survived being stabbed to death by the ancient sages, and he feels that he's been blessed by the gods with, you know, ultimate power. So it's just really cool to see how his character progresses on different timelines based on the events he encounters. And then with Skyward Sword, Obviously, you don't actually have Ganondorf himself, but they sort of, you know, dig even further into his backstory by creating this uh, this sort of precursor to him, Demise, who was supposed to be, like, the embodiment of all evil. I thought that and, was kind of lame. Oh, uh, well, you suck. <laughs> so, and when Demise is defeated, you know, he, he warns them that I'm going to be reincarnated, and as long as, you know, there's a Link and a Zelda, there's going to be an evil one challenging them as well. Right, right. You know my favorite thing about Ganondorf's backstory? What's that? How he was cloned from Captain Falcon. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> yes, because of course all characters begin and end with Smash Brothers. Anyway, um, good start, good start. Ganondorf is a great choice. I, I'm surprised I didn't think that's because yeah, you're dumb. It's it's an offbeat pick, but I, I agree. Like he's he is the one of the deeper characters in the Zelda series, in particular when you look at the Zelda timeline. Uh, I'd love to see them flesh out the King of Thieves element because we. Yeah. Sort of only got references to it in Ocarina of Time. He had already moved beyond being the King of Thieves to right. wanting to be a Demon King. Uh, it'd be nice to see as more of that. Yeah, for backstory. sure. Backstory. So I've got a pretty good, uh, you know, going just leapfrogging off of that. One of my favorites by far is Girahim. Um, Girahim from Skyward Sword. I just thought was a great villain. They so take, fabulous. He's so fabulous. They take all of the like wacky sort of really offbeat um, insanity psychopathy of Zant. Um, Mm -hmm. And they put it into a character that I feel like is actually well-designed and, like, actually has a good plot. And has some class. (laughs) Right. Neither of which (laughs) I think Zant has or does. Um, So I thought it was... He was this great character who was just a lot... You know, every time that Garahim showed up in a scene, he really stole the show. Loved Garahim. You know, my favorite line from any Zelda game is when he says, my heart was filled with rainbows. I, I don't even remember him saying that. That's amazing. Yeah, he, he's talking about how uh, the the time portal got destroyed and how it made him so upset. And then he's like, but then I discovered there was a second time portal and my heart was filled with rainbows. <laughs> That's amazing. But yeah, I just love Gear Him. I really hope 
um, he shows up in future Zelda games because I feel like Zelda has done so many times this this plot of like Ganondorf has this henchman who like wants to be his own villain but then Ganondorf just like kind of stabs him in the back and then is the main villain and I feel like you know, you know they've had Aghanim, Zant, Girahim, Vati in one of the games that Vati was in. Four Swords Adventures. Four, that's it. So they've just done that kind of thing with Ganon so many times that I hope they'd act I, I want them to like actually solidify it as a not necessarily a trope, but just a recurring story element that he has an actual henchman who isn't like a villain that Ganondorf piggybacks, but like just an actual servant to Ganon, like Girahim was to Demise in Skyward Sword. And I hope that if they do that, they do it with Girahim. You know, I could see Girahim being more autonomous and, and detached from Ganon uh, in the sense that, you know, he really is loyal to Demise. Uh, I mean, I Ganondorf can see that Ganondorf is sort too. of a demise replacement, but he's not, he's certainly not the origin of all evil. I mean, I could see that too from like a lore perspective, but I mean, yeah. I think from the perspective of like having a fleshed out and really strong Zelda cast, I think that having Girahim as Ganondorf's henchman, like in a recurring role uh, would be a really good way. Cause I, I think, I think it's time that Zelda stops doing these one-off villains. I think it's time that Ganondorf actually does take the role as like the main villain. Cause, cause there are only two games where he does that. And that's Ocarina of Time and Wind Waker. And all the others where he appears, he appears either more than halfway through or just at the very end. And it's just poorly written. It's just, it does, it, it's a, for it's so a many reasons, played it out trope work. at this point. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I wish they would, they would do something more with that. And I think, like I said, Gerham's the perfect choice uh, for that. It's just such a great character. It's, it's one that I think a lot of people really love and I want to see back for sure. He was on my honorable mentions for this discussion. Good. I really wanted him in Smash Bros, but oh, that didn't happen. No rainbows for you. No rainbows <laughs> in my heart. I've got Cafe from Majora's Mask. Okay. Mm. Um, he's a really unique character with a unique story, uh, unlike most of the NPCs that you see in the series where they kind of have this pretty flat backstory, uh, character development, character... Uh, he also has one of my favorite character designs in the series. I like the whole purple aesthetic. I like mm -hmm. his long shaggy hair. I like how he has red eyes for apparently no reason. Um, I love his clothing. Uh, I like the fact that he wears the Keaton mask like a bad ass. Um, <laughs> he has... It seems like they put a lot more effort into his character model than almost anyone else in the game. Well, I mean, everyone else in the game was just taken from Ocarina of Time. Mm -hmm. Well, It was actually made... Well, it's funny, actually. His his character model is actually based on Link's character model to the point that they borrowed a lot of his animations from Link. Uh, and you can tell this because he's the only NPC in the game where he can be affected by things like uh, that dog in Clock Town. If he attacks you and you're nearby Cafe, it will also affect Cafe. Or if you drop a bomb nearby him, it will actually affect him. He will hmm. sort of wince like Link winces. Well, and you right. can draw a parallel there just because, you know, he was transformed by Skull Kid from an adult to a child, and Link has already grown up and become adult and then you yeah. know, gone back in time to relive his childhood. So there's yeah. that connection between them as well. Yeah, that actually gets into one of the other things I was going to say, which is uh, that story of him getting turned into a child underlines kind of one of the themes of Majora's Mask, which is that uh, we're really kind of powerless to alter fate and the ravages of time, except for characters like Link uh, who are only able to do it because they can go outside of time. Uh, so, you know, if you look closely at the story and what the characters are able to do within a story, uh, Link is only able to save Termina because he can, you know, rewind time with his knowledge of the future. But the other characters besides Link, only, the only characters who really demonstrate any agency are the children. All the adults either die in the process of trying to change their fate, <laughs> or they turn into monsters like Pamela's father. Uh... So it's a, it's a cool thematic device that ties back to sort of Majora's Mask's place in the timeline, where Majora's Mask only happens because Link goes back to his childhood with the knowledge of the future. Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I thought that was really cool. And Cafe, you know, is the only character in Majora's Mask who isn't a child at the start of the game. He turns into a child uh, because of Skull Kid's curse. Good choice. Interesting. Yeah, he's one of my favorites as well. Well... To to wrap, I don't know if you guys have any other Zelda characters. I had to, I had about. to just pick one. So okay, well, I was just, I want to give a special shout out to Tingle, because he is my man. But even more of a special shout out to Groose, yes, because he's my double man. Yes, Groose would have been my other pick. Groose uh, is so fantastic. 
And unlike Giriham, I don't think they can bring back Groose and like keep him the way he was and like make him work with the rest of the Zelda cast and like do a fun thing again. It, it's kind of funny because when At I first saw Groose and I first heard of Skyward Sword's place in the timeline and I first heard inklings that they'd be explaining Ganondorf's backstory, I was thinking almost maybe that Groose would somehow be co-opted into becoming the main villain of the game. Yeah, I was kind of thinking that when I was playing Skyward Sword. And then, you know, because of the red hair and the yellow eyes, maybe yeah. he becomes an ancestor to the Gerudo. Right. But, and then maybe they'll do that in some kind of sequel. The but... Grusto. Yes, the Grusrudo. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just wanted to give, give a shout out to him because he makes Skyward Sword worth playing. <laughs> I mean, it takes place in Grooseland, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the to legend be, of I, Skyward Sword is already worth playing, but I mean, for Groose alone, it would be worth playing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ben's comment made me think. Do we think they should make a Groose spinoff, The Legend of Groose? Honestly, I ca- I mean, not like an actual Legend of Groose thing. It'd have to be like a. It'd have to be like a Tingle game sort of. He spin-off. should be in Hyrule Warriors too. Like, oh without God, question. yes. Um, but also, I mean, I think they should do something with Groose. Uh, not necessarily a whole adventure game, but you know, they have like Tingle's Rosy Rupee Land. Yeah, Live action movie. Something else. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Or they uh, could actually make a full-on uh, 90s high school sitcom version of Skyward Sword. <laughs> <laughs> Would watch. Hello, everybody. Thank you for listening to this Nintendo Week Clip NWC. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to us here on YouTube for more highlights and discussion videos from Nintendo Week Podcast. Or subscribe to us on iTunes for weekly breakdowns of all your Nintendo news, discussion segments on subjects, games, and more, and tons of other features. Thanks for listening, and we will see you tomorrow with another NWC.